Before we get into what we have to say today, because I have said many, many things already in the course of the week, but sometimes I have found out from experience, from place to place, that even after I have talked for one hour plus, sometimes it is what you say for two minutes that people hear. The rest, they may not quite hear. There was a case of a woman, an elderly woman, who would always come to church. She never missed church. But she was known for one thing. She always came late. And even if she came late, she had a special seat in front that people left for her. Nobody would sit there. Because it does not matter any time that she comes. She goes right up to that seat. And if anyone is sitting there, she tells you to move. So the church knew that that was her seat. And so it is better to leave the seat for her because you know she would always come. And on this particular day, as usual, she came late. She sat in her usual seat and the priest was deep into the sermon. And as he was preaching and giving all the signs, the woman began to cry. She was weeping and the priest was getting more into it. Of course, he was happy that whatever he was preaching must be touching the woman so much so that she could not control herself. She was weeping. At the end of the mass, the priest sent for the old woman. He said, Mama, come. So Mama went to the sacristy and he said, Mama, tell me, what is it about my sermon that touched you so much? that made you cry during the sermon. Mama say, Father, if I tell you, you too will begin to cry with me. And Father say, tell me, I want to know. Mama said, Father, as you were talking and moving your head up and down, I was looking at your beards. And I remembered my goat that they stole two weeks ago had a beard like your own. And so I began to cry. So I want to know if there is anything about me that distracts you so that I will remove it from the way. Because I want to make sure you are here with us. Because everything I am saying is important. I'm only here for a few more days. And I need to make sure you understand what I am saying so that you are clear in your minds. And let me say in passing, in summary, everything that I have said. I have said in so many words, there is no one that is greater than God. I have a God who never fails. I have also said in many words, and for the sake of those who have not heard, there is also the devil. I have not denied, and I have not, and I will not say there is the devil. And the devil has powers and can possess people. But, please listen, you know, but the devil is not greater than God. And his powers are not greater than God. So don't go away and say, Father said, there is no devil. There is devil. And there are people that are possessed by the devil. Just like we read in the gospel, a woman with a child with an unclean spirit went to Jesus to ask him 
to cast away the demon. So there is the devil. There are possessions. However, what I said and very clearly is number one, I do not waste my time chasing the devil. You know why? How can I chase, number one, the person that I do not see? So if you come to church, maybe like you came to church this evening, and you saw me on the altar, I am doing like this, uh, but you don't see an opponent, what would you say? You say something is wrong with Father, not be so. I know the devil can come in different shapes, but what I have said is that my time is short, both on earth and anywhere I am. I don't have all the time in the world. So rather than spend my time pursuing the devil, I spend the time praising God. And I allow God pursue the devils for me because he sees, he knows them. Let me explain this very clearly for at least a lesson. Here in Port Harcourt, every day when you gather in your prayers, we are casting, isn't it, and binding the devil in most cases. And I have heard in different assemblies, people will bind and cast, and they say, devil, we cast you into the deepest recesses of hell. You are doing it here in Port Harcourt. They are doing it in Enugu. They are doing it in Thailand, in America. They are doing it in Ibadan. They are casting the devil into the deepest recesses of hell in Benin. You are chaining them and binding them and putting them into the deepest recesses. How come? Is somebody releasing them from there? How come they are still around? Do you understand what I am saying? You have been chaining and casting and binding them. You have put them into the deepest recesses of hell. Who is there releasing them after you put them there? It is simply because you do not even understand what you do when you pray. You see what I am saying? The same devils you are binding and casting and putting into the deepest recesses of hell are still after you. They are legion. They are many. Why are they after you? How is it you have not overcome them? Because you have not understood where your power lies. Because you have not understood the power of prayers. Because you do not even understand what you do when you go into prayer. And so you waste your precious time. You are casting and binding and yet they are not going away. So I am not saying it is a bad prayer. Listen to me. I'm not saying those who pray that way should not pray that way. If that is how you can say your prayers all well and good. But if only you understand, if only you have the eyes to see and the mind to understand, you would not be fighting that battle alone. You would not even lose sleep. You know, when I go to bed, I sleep soundly. It doesn't even take me five, ten minutes. I sleep. When I get on the road to travel, I travel with confidence. When they tell me there are a thousand demons or demons waiting by that door, and that is the door I want to pass, I walk with confidence. Because I have no reason to be afraid of them. Because I know the armor and the shield that I carry. So I walk with confidence. You know what? They will be the one clearing the road when I get there. So I don't waste my time with them. Do you know what the devil likes the most? To distract you. So that the time you should spend in praising God, you spend it trying to understand and call the names of the devil. What use is it to your spiritual growth 
and salvation if you know the names of all the devils and yet you have not spent a moment praising God as you should. So all I have said is I spend my time simply praising God. I will praise him always and I let God do the rest because he who gave me life is able to see me through to the end. So now, is that clear with everybody? And when I talked about dreams, what I meant, and I repeat that very clearly, is that when people come to me and they tell me, Father, I am possessed, I don't jump to conclusions because many of those who say they are possessed are not even possessed only because they have been led astray. So I investigate, I take my time, I question the person. I want to find out how did you come to this knowledge and understanding. I want to see the signs and the signs are there if you are. I have seen people that have been possessed and I know there was one lady that warned me after a session like this, said, Father, please, do not pour holy water on me. She actually warned me after mass. I thought it was a joke. So I began to watch for her. Every time she was coming forward for either of our tree, she would hide behind the back of somebody. And me, I would look for her and aim her with the holy water. She told me that every time that water touches her, it burns her body. I found out from questioning her that it was true. She was afraid of holy water. And because she knew I would always pour it on her, she st stopped coming when I was celebrating Mass. So I have seen cases, and I know they are real. But there is no one that is greater than God. There is no juju. There is no cult, there is no oboni, there is no power that is greater than the power of God. No one, no one, and I repeat, no one. My dear brothers and sisters, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Knock and the door will be open to you. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Go to God, knock, the Lord will open the door for you. Seek, you will find. Ask, and you will receive. Now, that is probably the easiest way to put it. That is the easiest way to put it. But there is an understanding that is tied to that passage. Ask, the question is, what do you ask for? What is the motive of the thing that you ask for? Seek, what is your intention for seeking? What do you desire in seeking? You see, St. James had an answer clearly in the scriptures for us. Let me take you to that passage. Let us see what St. James says about our asking and seeking and why we sometimes do not receive. James was speaking to us in James chapter 4. And he began by saying, What causes fights? and quarrels among you. Don't they come from your desires? What you desire, you want, so you ask. And he says, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill in order to have it. You covet, remember the commandment? You must not covet anything of your neighbor, whether your, their wife, their property, and so on. 
So you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So, now, join that part of James to what we have just said in Matthew 7:7. 7, 7. So it is not just enough to ask, but what is your motive? What is your intention? What is your desire? What do you intend to do when you ask? Now, let me give you a very simple example, something that we can relate to. So let us start from there. We already know what prayer is. So let me not belabor you by trying to define prayer. We understand that to pray, it means to communicate with God, to be in a dialogue, to be in a relationship, to talk to God and to let God talk back to us. But for some of us, it is a one-way traffic. We want to do the talking, but we hardly allow God to respond, to talk back. So, all that you have heard many times from different preachers. But let me concentrate on what I want to talk about. I will give you a few scenarios. One day, it was during the harvest of a parish, and the priest was insistent, and he told the people, everyone come with some products from what you sell or you do. If you are working in an office and you are paid a salary, come with some of the money to give thanks. However, if you are a trader or a worker or a manufacturer or a producer of any products, come with the products for thanksgiving. So people brought different things. Yam, bananas, they brought properties that they sell. But there was one man who made coffin and he decided to bring a coffin to church. In fact, I am sure you already know what happened. Nobody went with him for Thanksgiving. Everybody scattered that day. But he has a right. He brought his own trade, what he was producing. So let me ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, listen to this. If the man who makes coffins goes to church and kneels down by the altar and he says, Lord God, you know me. Bless me. <laughs> now, prayer now. Not be so. He has a right to pray. Say, God, bless my business. Bless me so that I can have money to feed my family as Christmas is coming. Is it a good prayer? Uh -huh, confusion. You see now? <laughs> Okay, or oh, your yeah, jam break. Hold that one first. Hold that one. Number two, I said I will give you different scenarios. Number two, the person who drives a tow truck under this hot sun has been waiting and waiting, maybe on this portal called to wear a road, and there is no job. And the wife is complaining no money for soup for market. And then the man comes to church, he prays, God, do something. God, give me a job. And maybe Mr. Okonkwa from the same parish is traveling and the car spoil. Is it the prayer of the man that made the car spoil? Okay, number two. Number three. At some time, I've forgotten the year exactly, when Governor Mawa, the military governor, was governor of Lagos State. He received a letter towards Christmas, and it was signed by Association of Armed Robbers. 
I didn't know they had an association, but it was clearly signed. They thanked Mawa for the good work he was doing in Lagos State because he had operation. What was that operation? For those, well, some of you would remember, he had an operation, a combined forces of both army and police to drive out criminals from Lagos. And he succeeded. I think it's Operation Push or something. Sweep, thank you, thank you, God bless you, Operation Sweep. And he succeeded. And Lagos, for a time, became free of crime. And so they wrote him a letter saying, you will know you are doing a great job, but please consider that we are also citizens of this state. And as Christmas is coming, please, Take all your police and soldiers away from the road for at least three days, period, only three days, so that we can do our work and have something to feed our family. So if an armed robber comes to church to pray and says, God, you know it is condition that put me like this. Please bless me tonight. I am going for operation. Let me succeed and I will thank you. Is it a good prayer? <laughs> ah, some say yes, some say no. Some say, okay, no. Now you can answer that one clearly. Now let us, let us analyze the three very simply. The man who sells coffin has to sell coffin in order to survive and to feed his family. And somebody has to sell coffin, by the way. Because whether you like it or not, people must die. So it is not his fault when people die. What he is saying, very simply, is God, when somebody dies, send them to my store so that they can buy from me, and that way I will have money to feed my family. It is a good prayer. He is not praying for Mrs. Bimbo or Okonkwo or a maker or Joseph to die. But however, if Joseph dies, God sent them to my store. In 2009, I was away in Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand on mission, and my father died. And I had to come home for the funeral. But before I came home, I gathered a few bucks and I sent them home to my elder brother. And I said, go look for a coffin not an expensive one, we can't afford that, but get something good enough with which we can bury our father. So my brother searched around and he found a good place and he bought one. And when I came home, I was impressed. I said, how much is this? And I found that it wasn't too expensive, but it was good. I finished the funeral and I returned to Thailand. Less than three months after that, my grandmother followed. And of course, we rallied around and I sent the money that I had and I said, why don't you go back to that man? Since he gave us a good deed the last time, go and buy from him again. So my brother went and bought from that man. Number two, less than six months after that, my younger sister followed. And of course, it was my brother's place to go and buy another coffin. As soon as he stepped into the store of the man, the man said, customer, welcome. My brother said, God forbid, if you are the one taking all my people, stop. I don't want to be your customer. When I heard, I was laughing. I said, it is not the man's fault. Whether you buy from him or not, you will still have bought a coffin. After all, who is a customer? Is it not somebody who frequents your store to buy? <laughs> you, you are a customer now. But of course, we can understand the mentality, the way we think. I have been in a public transportation in Ibadan. If you know Ibadan, when you are driving through Mokola Road, there is a cemetery just in the Songo area. The cemetery is to the right, depending on where you're going. If you're going towards Mokola, 
So I was with some women, market women and others, and I think they were talking excitedly and looking out of the window. And then when some of them saw the cemetery, they immediately, it was almost like automatic, they turned around, they said, God forbid. So they turned from the right, they immediately turned their faces to the left. But unknown to them, right on the left-hand side, there were people who were selling coffins. So as they said, God forbid to the right, they saw on the right, God forbid. So double, God forbid the right, God forbid the left. So which one was left? They closed their eyes. My dear brothers and sisters, I thought that was a very funny reaction. So if you like, say God forbid, even me that I am talking to you, I will die. I don't know when I will die. But I am not afraid of death. And so when I go into prayers, I do not go with the fear of what will happen to me tomorrow. So number one, what I want to talk about tonight is that when you come into prayer, you must trust, you must have faith, you must believe that the one to whom you are praying is able to do that that you ask of him. The letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, let us read part of that letter. The letter to the Hebrews. Now, what does the letter to the Hebrews say to us? Let me read part of that to you. Chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 6, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So, the very important number one point is if you must come to prayer, come believing. Come with faith. Come with trust. Come trusting that God is able to do what he says he will do. And when you can truly believe, it is the beginning. Look at all the people that came to Jesus to ask. Jesus would say to them, your faith has healed you. Your faith, because Jesus needs a response from us. It is not as if God cannot walk. He can do anything he wants. Look at the woman that we read in the gospel. She went to Jesus. My daughter is afflicted with evil spirit. Come and heal her. Jesus said, it is not right to give the food meant for the children to the dogs. But her faith was resolute. She was not to be deterred. She said to Jesus, but even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the children's table. And Jesus said, great indeed is your faith. Your daughter is well again. Look at the woman who had the flow of blood for 12 years. All she needed was to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. If only I can touch him. And she did. And Jesus said, who touched me? And the apostles were surprised. But people are rushing around you. And many are falling over on you. How can you ask who touched me? But Jesus knew that somebody had touched him because power had left him. And when the woman realized, she said, I did. And Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. And sometimes Jesus turned to those who asked, do you believe that I can do it? So it is important that you trust. Because if you do not, then you will not come to prayer with the confidence that you need in order to receive that which you are praying for. My God will supply all your needs, remember, according to his riches in glory. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Now, let me dwell on that. 
He says, my God will supply all your needs. He did not say some. He says all. In other words, God knows everything that you need. Psalm 139 will tell us, even before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. The days allotted to you had all been recorded in my book before any of them began. And then the psalmist will say, Lord, where can I go to hide from you? If I go to the deepest valleys, you are there. If I hide in the deepest distance, you are there. So you know me true and true. And the Lord will say, even before a word is formed on your lips, I know it. So that it is not because you have said it. No. God knows the needs of your heart even before you mention them. So the question is, if he knows, why do we need to pray? I would explain that very simply. Because God, in creating us, created us in freedom. So the freedom to choose is part of the extension of the essence of love. Love will have no meaning if there is no freedom to choose. And so, God gives us the liberty to make choices. He knows that if we do not choose him, we would not have life. And so what he has done is he has sent us prophets and priests to teach us, to provide for us the relevant information that we need so that we can understand that it is only in God that we live and move and have our being. Cut off from him, we can do nothing. And if only we can choose him, then our life will have meaning. Our lives will be full. Our lives will be real. So it gives us that liberty and opportunity to exercise in freedom that choice. Because in exercising the liberty to choose, you expand, as it were, your capacity to receive. So give us this day our daily bread. It's not as if God does not know what we need. He knows. But you see, the difference here is many of the things we ask for in prayer are in order to satisfy our pleasures. We do not need them, but maybe we think we need them. We want them, but there is a difference between needs and wants. Let me explain that again, because some of these points are important. My dear brothers and sisters, one of my big work is what I am doing now, retreats. I get invited everywhere. For some time, I was the national chaplain of NFCS, the National Federation of Catholic Students. That is. The national chaplain meant that I was in charge of all the universities in Nigeria. I started as an assistant national chaplain, and then I became the substantive chaplain before I went on mission in 1990, 2007, I believe, yes. Now, within that period, I traveled a lot. I covered many places of this country. Today I was in Calabar, tomorrow I was here in Port Harcourt, the next day I may be in Jos or Kando or Sokoto. That's how my work was. And then the next week I'm rushing back to Ibadan to teach and then off again. So for that kind of job, I needed a car to get me from point A to point B. And not just a car, I needed a good car that is not going to be breaking down every five kilometers or ten. So at least I need a good car. But I may want five cars, but do I need five cars? I don't. I need a roof over my head so that by the time I am done with walking and I am tired, 
I need to be able to return to a place I can call my home and rest under the roof. So I need a roof, but do I need a house with a hundred rooms? No, I don't. I may want it for status so that people can say, wow, it has arrived, but do I need it? Now, let me ask you, suppose I have five cars in the house. How many can I ride at any point in time? One. What if I decide to ride four and I tell my servants, bring them, bring the, the Homer Jeep, bring the uh, Highlander, bring the BMW, bring the Volkswagen, put them side by side. Then I put my right leg in one. I put the left leg in another. I put my head in another. And I put my hand and I said, I want to ride the five. What will happen to me? I am dead. I am dead. What if I have even 10 rooms in my house? And I say, I want to sleep in the 10 rooms before the night is out. And I instruct my servants, please, after every 30, 30 minutes, come and carry me from room A to room B to room C to room D. Will I ever get to sleep? No. So I really don't need 10 rooms. I technically need just one room. But you see, we get frustrated because many of the things we think we need, we really don't need. But we want them because our friends have them. Because it will create a social status for us. Because we want to show off. And so, we become false to ourselves. We lie to ourselves. When you live a life beyond your means, when you live a life out of the desire to impress others, you are not living with integrity because you are not only lying to yourself, you are creating a false impression about yourself to people outside, which you don't need to do. I do not need to pretend if my salary is 10,000, I need to live within the limits of my 10,000. In the bid of trying to impress people, then I go out and I borrow and I create a false life around me because that's what I want the people to believe. That is not being honest with yourself. That's not integrity. The Lord wants us to be whole. The Lord wants us to understand what truth and integrity means. And so when you come to prayer, these points must be clear in your heart. Now, another quick example. In one of my missions, just like I have been telling you, I tell the people, write your petitions, write your intentions, the points that you want us to pray with you. When I first started retreats, I would pick out at random, maybe one, two, three, four envelopes and open them on the altar. And I will read them. But of course, since nobody writes their names, it doesn't matter. What I need is to see what the people, the prayer points the people are asking for, so that we can use those prayer points as, as we say, point of contact to others. But I was particularly interested in one very fat envelope that I saw in the box. It was quite thick. So I pulled it out. And I discovered that it was about four full scarf sheets that the person had written. So I was curious. And I began to read it on the altar, and I was stopped short in my reading. Because evidently it was written by a woman, because the way she was talking, you could tell. God, thank you for my life. You know, I am a good woman, but people are always looking for my trouble. In fact, that mama in Kechi, God, you see, every time I wake up, trouble, trouble. She did, does not only spoil my name, she does it. God punish her for me. In fact, all her children, do not let them succeed. Anything she puts her hand to, Holy Ghost, fire them. I am not joking. 
Can you imagine four full scrap sheets of courses about every person that she did not like? And then at the end, she was asking God to bless her and to bless her children. Is God a fool to be used that way? So that evening, my sermon changed, and I said exactly what I was talking about. The motive is wrong. The intentions, the desires are wrong. And you do not go to God and ask God to punish and kill your enemies, and yet you are asking him to bless you. The truth is, you should pray that God should keep your enemies alive so that they will live long enough to see what God will make of you. You must never pray for the death of anyone. You must never curse anyone. You see, I know we like warfare. I know we like to go into battle. I know we want to destroy our enemies. But true Christianity is not about destroying anyone. It is about winning every soul for God. And God loves the creatures of his sons. And heaven is open to everyone, including the most despicable of all sinners. Look at the story of the thief on the cross. This was a man who had stolen probably all his life. Maybe he started as a little child. He was stealing little things and grew up. Nobody corrected him. And in the process of stealing, he had hurt many people. He had defrauded many people. And maybe he killed some along the way. And he betrayed the trust other people had in him. And for that reason, he was convicted to dying on the cross on the side of Jesus. One of the thieves wanted to return to his way of crime. And he says, are you not the son of God? Save yourself and save us. But this particular thief saw his moment of grace. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And he said, that very moment, Jesus said to him, this very moment, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus did not say tomorrow. Jesus did not say next week you will come to paradise. Jesus did not say, uh, after you have suffered for your sins. No. All he needed to say were those words. He saw the opportunity for salvation, the auspicious moment, his moment of grace, and he seized it. In fact, he stole it. And guess what? A thief who stole and defrauded and killed people is today called the good thief because he was the first to enter heaven before Abraham and Moses and all others. In fact, I want to be that thief. Do you understand what I am saying? So the mercy of God cannot be reduced to the thoughts of men. God is not man that he will think like man. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. As far as the heavens are from the earth, so are his ways from our ways and his thoughts from our thoughts. So what am I saying in essence? When you come to prayer, what is in your heart? Do you desire to do the will of God or do you seek to satisfy your own desires? What do you ask for in prayer? So that is a very important point. I prayed once, my dear brothers and sisters. Of course, I say many prayers. But I prayed once a very important prayer that I have not forgotten. But see where the prayer has gotten me. And let me explain the basis of that prayer. In 1988, I had gone out to do my service, my national youth service. I, I served in the federal government college on Zaria Road in Jos. And I returned to my university to continue my master's program. And when I went home on a little break, it was my turn to go to the post office. And when I went to the post office and I picked up the mails, I saw there was one particular letter that was addressed to my elder brother. And when I looked at the return address, 
it was from the SMA fathers. So of course I was curious, what was my brother doing with the SMA's fathers? So I was curious, when I got home, I had to take a letter opener and I opened the mail and I read it and I was surprised to find out that my elder brother was writing to the SMAs because he wanted to be a priest and I said wow so he's keeping this secret from me so I cleverly covered the letter and I put it on his table please don't go and open people's letter I'm not saying it's right it was wrong what I did I shouldn't have opened but I was curious so I opened and at the same time I found out that my immediate younger brother was also applying to another religious group. And of course, I was happy for them. And so as soon as I returned to the school, to my chaplaincy, the first thing I did was to go to our chaplain. The, our chaplaincy in Ife was run at that time by the Dominicans, Father Farmer, and then later on Father Gilbert Tessin. So I went to Father Gilbert Tessin and I said, Father, I need to book for masses. And he said, Daniel, what is your intention? And how many masses? I said, Father, nothing less than nine masses, a novena. He said, wow, then the intention must be very serious. I said, yes, oh, Father, it's very serious. And he said, what is it? I said, I need you to write and pray to God for me that at least one of my brothers should become a priest so that I would be happy that we have a priest in our family. Father was surprised, said, okay. He wrote it down, and I paid the money required for booking masses. And as I turned to go, he called me back. He said, Daniel, come back. I said, yes, Father. He said, but what about you? What do you want yourself? I said, Father, no, it's not for me, and I meant my brothers. He said, yes, don't you want anything from God yourself? What intention do you want me to write for you? I said, but Father, I didn't mean for me. He said, yeah, but what do you want? Because he put me on the spot, I had to think of something. I said, okay, Father, in that case, write in the petition that God should give me a good wife that will not send me to an early grave. Amen. That's exactly what I told him. I said, I want a good wife, not the one that is, uh, <clears throat> you know what I mean. I didn't want one that would send me to my death early. Father was laughing when he wrote that intention. My dear brothers and sisters, to cut a long story short, what I am saying now happened in 1989, thereabout. Many years after, to cut a long story short, my elder brother has been married for over 20 something years. And his first daughter just got married two weeks ago. And my younger brother has a child as well. And guess what? See me now. Why are you clapping? Cool down. Wait, it is very simple. Listen. It's very simple. I prayed to God that he should make one of my brothers father. Did I ask for me? Did I ask? I asked God for good wife, but see what he has given to me. So I want to ask, listen, everyone. My prayer was clear in my head. How many people in this church think well before you vote? How many people will say, God answered my prayer? Raise up your hand. Think well, Lou, because I will call one or two persons. How many people in this church are saying, God answered my prayer? You see, people are afraid. They are not even sure. Okay, wait. We see. All right, wait. How many people will say, God did not answer my prayer? Raise up your hand. Uh-uh. Thank you, sister. Yes. How many people are not sure whether he answered or did not answer? You have to vote to one side. You see what we are saying? Okay, how many people say God answered my prayer? All right, let me, Oga, come. Come, come. How many people say God did not answer my prayer? You raise up your hand, come. Yes, come, 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 two of you. They are closer to me, come. Come and tell us, please, come, come, come. Don't be shy, come. 
Let us listen. He said, God answered my prayer. Do we have another microphone there? Okay, don't worry, you can use this. Tell us in a short way. Tell us why you say God answered my prayer. Father prayed for a wife that will not send him to this early grave. All right. All right. Tell them how you say God answered my prayer. This wife, the ring in father's hand now, is totally married to Christ. So therefore, Christ will not take his life. No. Anymore. Did I because ask Christ to marry me? You, Papa. You are bound, you are bound no. to Christ. Mm -mm. I said I want a good wife. Did I say it is Christ? I beg give sister, let us answer. Let us hear. No. I don't agree. Yes. Did God, you say God did not answer my prayer. So tell them why you say God did not answer my prayer. There was actually a time I was praying for a dead, uh, for my uncle to die. But he didn't die. If the God turned the prayer for me to forgive, and so, I have to forgive him. So God did not answer my prayer. Okay, good. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Okay, let me explain it simply. I know we all have different opinions. Now, remember, when I was talking about prayer, I talked about your own interest and the will of God, isn't it? Because the scriptures will tell us the reason why we do not hear answers to our prayers, sometimes we ask with the wrong motive. Now, maybe to an extent my motive was good because here I was praying to God for a priest in our family. But I was saying, God, choose from our, among my brothers so that we can have one. But it was what I wanted. I was not asking according to his will. Now, indeed, God answered my prayers in many ways. But it was according to his will. Indeed, I asked for a priest in our family. But instead of choosing any of my brothers, he chose me. And he gave my brother a very good wife. And she does not give any of us trouble in the house. And they have been married for 20-something years. And I just celebrated the wedding of their first daughter two weeks ago. My dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of finding peace in your prayers is recognizing that it is in the will of God there we find our peace. You know, Jesus always said in John chapter 4 verse 34, he says, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete it. So what I should have been asking, even when I was praying, I should have said, God, let it be done according to your will. When Jesus had to suffer in the garden, he says, Lord, take this cup of suffering away from me, but not according to my will, but let your will be done. If I must drink this cup, then let your will be done. When Mary was told by the angel, you have been chosen to be the mother of Christ, the son of God, Mary said, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let what you have said be done unto me, according to your will. You know, we already have a beautiful prayer that we say. We say, Jesus, I love you. All I have is yours. Yours I am, and yours I want to be. Do with me whatever you will. You see how it is? Do with me whatever you will. In other words, I belong to Christ. And everything that I am, that I will ever be, that I have, actually belongs to him, whether I admit it or not. But now I am exercising my freedom in saying, yours you know I am, and yours I want to be. Now, do with me whatever you will. I may not understand it. I may not realize it. I may not see the whole picture, but do with me whatever you will. So indeed, God answered my prayer, but not in the very way in which I had asked for it. And let me say this. Let me say this. When people sit up to either curse me or tell me I am a fool or anything, I don't worry. God answers all prayers, I've said. Even when people curse me, 
God who sees the intentions of my heart, the disposition of my mind, will take those causes and turn them into blessings for me. If, and I put if, if I do not seek evil for anyone, so that even if I see you kneeling down and cursing me, the one thing I would not say, I would not say, God, return to sender. No. I would say, God, bless that man for cursing me. What if you are the one that sent him? What if I really deserve to be cursed for my sins? Remember when Absalom was threatening to take over the throne from his father, David, and as he began to run out, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, from the family of Saul, went out and began to curse David. And Joab, the military commander, said, let us take off his head. David said, no, let him be. What if God had sent him to curse me? Let him be. For if this is the hand of God, he will again bless me. But when you take laws into your hands and you pray for the destruction of your enemies, you are blocking effectively Please note this, oh. I know people don't like this, but I am looking at you and speaking candidly. You are blocking effectively your own gateway to receiving your blessings. That is why I am not surprised that many of us go into prayers and we do not receive what we have asked for because we pray with wrong motives. We pray with wrong intentions. We pray without thinking of the will of God. I believe in the power of prayers. And the greatest prayer for me, my dear brothers and sisters, is not the number of times you shout. It's not the number of times you receive anointing, like we say, anointing, anointing breaks the yoke. No, it's not the number of times you go to the mountain. It's not the number of times you jump around. No. The greatest prayer, and there is no other that can equal it, is the prayer of the mass. Write it down. Quote me. In a lifetime, put together all the prayers you have been saying on the mountain, outside the mountain, in the valley, close to the river, put them together on a scale. Put everything on a scale. Put one mass, one single mass that you have prepared for well. You went to confession. You got to mass early. Your heart is fully disposed towards God and towards man. And you are not holding any hatred in your heart against anyone. And you truly participate and you receive Jesus at Holy Communion, and you do what is required, put that one single mass on the other side of the scale. I can tell you, quote me, the scale would weigh on the side of that one single mass, and for good reasons, because all the other prayers that we can talk about are prayers from the lips and mouth and hands of sinful men and women like you and I. St. Paul will tell us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in the Mass, the prayer of the Mass is a prayer of thanksgiving. And in that thanksgiving, Jesus Christ, who is God, is the high priest. There is only one Mass, by the way. Jesus Christ, who is God, is the lamb of sacrifice and so jesus who is god is like god offers god to god jesus the high priest jesus the lamb of sacrifice offers that sacrifice to god how can god ever say no to god it is not possible it has never happened and it will not happen God can never say no to God. The devil knows it. That is why it discourages you from going to Mass. Sometimes I wonder when people come to me, Father, pray for me. And then I tell them, 
go and book a mass. They look at me strangely. What is he saying? I want him to pray for me. I want him to shake and sweat and call down on God and send down anointing. And he's saying, go and book a mass. This father does not know how to pray. And they go away sad. And I smile and I said, if only they understand. Do you know the story of Naaman the leper? Of how he went to, uh, from Syria to the land of Israel to look for the prophet of God. And he came to the house of Elish, Elisha. And he says, Elisha never got up from the room. He sent a message, go and tell him to dip himself in the river seven times. He says, nonsense. If that was what was required, I could have dipped myself in the waters of Syria, which are better than the waters of Israel, the Jordan and everything. Why did I have to travel all this way? When I thought the man of God would come out and wave into the sky and call down the power of God from the skies and send an anointing and heal me. Expectations, wrongly placed. That was Nehemiah's expectation. But how can men reduce God to the level of thinking of men? God does not have any need to impress anyone. The servant girl said to him, if the man of God had asked you to do a difficult thing, you would do it. Now he has given you a simple thing. You don't want to. So he went. And when he dipped himself in the water, what happened? The transformation. He was healed of his leprosy. When Elijah on the Mount Carmel had the great battle with the priests of Baal, they had a whole day. They shouted, they gashed themselves with knives, they called on their gods, they made loud noise, but God was not present to them. And when it came to the time of the evening sacrifice, what did Elijah do? He just cut the animal for sacrifice into pieces and he says, Lord, show your power. Show that you are God. Send fire from heaven and consume this sacrifice. That's all he needed to see and fire came down and of course that's where we get this song from the lord that answered by fire he will be my god the lord that answered by fire he will be my god the lord that answered by fire he will be my god the lord that answered by fire he will be my God. So, stop thinking that it is the priest that runs about that is bringing God down. You are wasting your time. Listen, dear brothers and sisters, I have been teaching for 20-something years in the seminary. And I know what people sometimes want to hear. If this was a performance in the theater, I'm a good actor. I know what to do. I am not drained of strength. I am not a young man. I am 52, yes. But I can run from one end of this church to another. I can wave and dance. I can shout hallelujah. I can do anything if the idea is to excite you and say, hey, Look at the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is here. Hey! Anointing breaks the yoke. Guess what? After I do all that theatrics, and I made you shout, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! I could have been doing that since. And at the end, you will be so warmed up, you will be sweating, and by the time you go home, they will say, what did Father say? He say, hi, that Father talk, eh? Where did he talk? Hi, he just talk. Where did he talk? Ah, he was full of the Spirit. Do you know what you have succeeded in doing? You go away empty. You have praised God, oh. You have danced around. You have celebrated. But you have no foundation. Because the very first day, trials and temptation would come, your faith will fail you because you did not have faith grounded in the proper soil that it should have been. Let me tell you how faith and prayer works. 
And let me use the case of Abraham quickly to bring this talk together before we get to what we need to do today. The story of Abraham is very clear to every one of us. In Genesis chapter 12, the scriptures report the first encounter. I am mentioning all this because I have so much in my head that I want to talk about and I don't want to keep you all night. Please take note of these passages. You can read them on your own. I can tell all the stories without looking at the scriptures. I've been telling them for a long time. Now, in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham had that first encounter with God. And God called him Abraham. And he says, go forth. Go forth from your land, from amongst your people, from the place where you find your comfort, to a land where I will show you. Now, take note. God did not tell him what land. He said, go forth. Go from the place where you find your comfort, where you find your pleasure, where you are totally relaxed. And he says, there in that land, I will bless you. And I will make people bless you. And your name will be a blessing. And I will multiply you like the offsprings. And so on and so forth. Now, remember, God did not tell Abraham, in five years' time, these blessings will be realized. He just said, I will bless you. Go to the land that I will show you. Now, if you were Abraham, what would you have done? Abraham was not a young man in that passage. In Genesis chapter 12, he was already 75 years old. Abraham did not question God. Abraham did not say, God, come, slow down. This land you are talking about, where is the land? What about the people in the land? How are they? Are they kind people? Are they generous? Are they fierce warriors? Would I be able to live with them? What kind of food do they have? What can I expect? Any normal person would ask those questions. My dear brothers and sisters, I was already above 40 years, and I told you I was the national chaplain of NFCS when my august told me, drop everything that you are doing. We are sending you on a mission to a faraway land. I was to go to the Philippines and then from there to Thailand. The truth is I had never been to any of these places before. And at 40 something years, I wasn't exactly a young man. I had my worries and concerns. I had my fears. I had my thoughts. Number one, I was worried about my mother, God, who would look after her. I would be too far away. It would not be easy. That was my one concern. There were many other concerns. What about their food? Would I be able to survive? What about the people? Now, let me use this illustration and I'll bring it back to Abraham to conclude. I went into prayers. I said, God, you know my heart. If I have my way, I would rather not go. But if you are the one sending me, then give me a sign and give me the strength to go on. This was my prayer. I mean, not like in these words, but I said it in many ways. But this was the motive, this was the intention of my prayer. And then, about a month or so before I was to go, I sent a general text to all my friends on my phone and I said, guys, pray for me. I am being sent on a mission to, I, because I didn't really know where Thailand was on the map, so I said, to the other end of the world, a place close to China. People can relate to China. Not many people knew Thailand, so to speak. This was the general text that I sent to all my friends. I never mentioned anything. I just said, pray for me. I am going on a mission. A week after I sent the test, I get a phone call from a lady. This lady, I had met her previously like three or four years back on one of my missions in the Church of Assumption in Falomo in Lagos. She came to me over a certain consign. I listened, I prayed with her and the husband. 
They invited me once to their place for lunch. And then, of course, I left Lagos, went back to my station. After some time, we never communicated again. So for more than three years, I do not think I called this woman and she did not call me. I did not send her a text. But what I did when I was to go, I sent out a general text. So one of those tests evidently went to her. I remember the test was very simple. I said, pray for me, nothing else. And then this woman calls me, said, Father, I got your test. I said, yes, pray for me. And she said, Father, I was praying for you. And I felt God wanted me to speak to you. You know, people don't come to me and tell me such things easily. So at first I was suspicious. What is God sending her to talk to me about? He says, Father, I hope you don't mind. Can I ask you some personal questions? I said, go ahead, madam. But of course, my ears and eyes and everything were open. Because somebody I had not spoken to for three years calls me all of a sudden and wants to ask me personal questions. I said, yes. He said, what is going to happen to your mother when you go? I had never mentioned my mother to this woman. I had never discussed my mother. I had never even told her my mother was still alive. This was the question she asked me. So I pretended I didn't hear. I said, yes, what did you say? He said, Father, your mother. And I said, well, God will look after her as God has been looking after her. Remember, I only mentioned that in prayer, in my private prayer. He said, but Father, can I ask you a favor? Usually I'm scared when people say, can I ask you a favor? Because they always ask me for money and I don't have money. So I was scared. I said, okay, ask if it is something that I can do. He said, Father, is it possible for you to open an account in your mother's name and to give her the ATM and send me the account number? Nobody had ever. I said, I heard though, but I said, hey, hello, network problem. <laughs> you know, when you hear such things, you want to be doubly sure. I said, Madam, um, it is not clear. I heard all that. I said, what did you say? He said, Father, can you open a bank account in your mother's name? Send me the number and give her the ATM because I want to see what I can be sending to your mother on a monthly basis because where you are going is very far so that your heart can be in your mission. Wow. My dear brothers and sisters, I said, this is the hand and the answer of God. But now, hold on, hold on, hold on. I did that. I gave her the number, and I gave the ATM to my mother. And from the first month before I left, she paid 30000 into my mother's account. And for six months after, it was 30, 30000 I was in Thailand when I received a notice that she had increased it to 50,000. And for seven years that I was in Thailand, my dear brothers and sisters, this woman never failed. Every single month she paid 50,000 into the account for the upkeep of my mother. That did a lot. That was the hand of God at work. Now, when I come back, when I returned in 2014, I went to thank the woman, and I bought a special silk wrapper from Thailand, the, uh, the, the silk Thai wrapper, and I went to give to her to say thank you. All the workers knew me because every time I was on holiday, I went to see her. <coughs> so I left the office, and I went. That month, my mother called me. He said, Father, the money no come, oh. I said, Mommy, maybe the money has stopped because your son is back. He said, hey, call your friend now and ask her. I said, no. Remember, she had not met my mom, but they were communicating on the phone. I said, no, you do not call people when they are generous to you to ask. I said, this was a free gift. Now that I am back, maybe she has decided it was time to stop. Unknown to me, my mother did not have any shame, but she carried phone and called her herself. <laughs> she said, Auntie, 
that money you were sending to me was really helping me. But what happened this month? And my mother said, she heard that I said, what? You mean you did not get the money? She put the phone down. She did not put it off. It was on speaker. So my mother was hearing the conversation. She shouted and called the secretary, financial secretary. She said, come here. She said, that woman, who told you to stop paying money? She said, ah, madam, I thought we saw the son came back now. I thought the son has, he said, did I instruct you? Is it your money? This was what the woman was saying. So my mother was overhearing. He said, look, go back now. Drop everything you are doing. Go back, put this woman officially, uh, put her name officially in the salary scale. So as you are paying our salary, don't ask me again. Just simply pay to her account as if she is one of the workers. I do not stop until I say stop. My dear brothers and sisters, I have been back for four years. That account still receives every month 50,000. Praise the Lord. So even when I do not have to send to her, I know God is supplying for her through someone that she has never met. They have not yet met. So you see what I am saying? When you truly trust God, God provides for you. In the same way, in the case of Abraham, Abraham trusted God completely. He did not know what the journey held. I did not know what to expect in Thailand. And when I first arrived at the Philippines, the night we arrived, we were given rice to eat. I was happy. I said, ah, at least this is food I know from the house. The next morning, I woke up, I went for breakfast, I saw rice again on the table. I said, okay, maybe it is the rice left over from last night I ate. By afternoon, I came down for lunch, I saw rice. I said, okay, maybe the rice, the overcooked rice, so we ate rice again. By evening, I came down, it was rice. I said, ah, this thing is not for you. Maybe they wanted to finish the rice. The cook has not drawn the new timetable. The second day, I woke up, I came down, there was rice. This time I could no longer take it. I had to turn to the priest from Asia. I said, come, what is happening? Is there no other food? The man smiled. He said, welcome to Asia. He said, in Asia, whether in the Philippines, in Thailand, in China, rice is the food. Every other thing is an accompaniment to the food. He said, so, welcome to Asia. My dear brothers and sisters, for seven whole years, I was eating rice in the morning, rice in the afternoon, rice in the night. You see? So those who knew me before I went to mission, I, I used to be very slim. -o. When you see me, when I came back, I was weighing 106. Can you blame me? I was eating rice, morning, afternoon, evening. Rice in the morning, rice in the afternoon, rice in the night. No fish, no meat, rice, rice every day. But of course, there was fish and meat. But again, 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 I did not die. I had to adjust. This is what it means to trust the mercy of God. People eat it and they don't die. But by Genesis chapter 15, Abraham naturally was worried. Because God had blessed him in every way. God had blessed him with many things livestock, servants, great wealth. But the most important of all the blessings, his own son, God had not given to him. And Abraham was worried. And then in the vision of the night, in a dream, God took Abraham out and he led him out. Because Abraham was saying to God, of what use are these blessings that you have given to me if I do not have my own son to inherit them? They said God brought him out. And he says, look up in the sky. See if you can count the number of the stars. Do not be afraid, for so will your descendants be. This was Genesis chapter 15. Guess what? God still did not tell him how and when. So Abraham had to be patient. Abraham did not wait five years. Abraham did not wait 10 years. Abraham waited for 25 good years at God's own time. Let me jump again. 
In Genesis chapter 18, they said Abraham was sitting in the front of his house under a big tree, the oak of Mamre, when he saw three men that were traveling by. The Bible does not tell us that Abraham was in the habit of inviting every stranger to his house. But there was something unique about these three men. Abraham saw in them the aura and presence of God. Abraham saw something and he says these are not ordinary men. With his eyes of faith he was able to recognize the aura of God around these men. There were three men and he said to them do not pass me by. Come into my household. Stop. Let me give you water to drink. Water to wash your feet and a food for your stomach before you continue your journey. They said they listened, they stayed, they ate, and they drank. And when it was time for them to go, there were three men, but they spoke as one. One man spoke on behalf of the others, and he said to Abraham, at this time next year, we will return to you, and your wife, Sarah, will conceive and give birth to a son. Remember, this man had been waiting for 24 years because in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham was already 99 years old. Abraham became the father of Isaac when he was 100 years. And Sarah, the wife of Abraham, was 89 years old. How do you say to an 89 years old woman that was past her menopause, that her breast had become flat, that she would become the mother of a son? Who would believe that? Biologically speaking, it is out of the question. So Sarah understood that. Sarah was eavesdropping. When she heard the men say to Abraham, at this time next year, your wife Sarah would conceive and give birth to a son. Sarah chuckled to herself. She laughed. And then they turned to Abraham and they said, why did your wife Sarah laugh? Sarah was surprised because she did not laugh out. Remember, she was eavesdropping. She laughed in her belly, like we say. She laughed to herself, but she was surprised that they knew. Sarah said, no, I did not laugh. They said, no, you laughed, for you cannot hide it from God. You may cover your sins, and no one else may know, but you cannot hide it from God. So, but the promise, let me round up with this. The promise was not made to Sarah, but to Abraham, who is called our father in faith. So they turned to Abraham. Please, if you do not write any other passage tonight, write this next passage. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. They turned to Abraham, and they asked Abraham a very pertinent question. Abraham! Is there anything impossible for God? Parishioners of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, Port Harcourt, is there anything impossible for God? Indeed, there is nothing impossible for God. And it came to pass that Abraham became the father of Isaac when he was a hundred years old, and when Sarah, the wife, was 19 years old, praise the Lord. He said, abundantly able to deliver and to save. My dear brothers and sisters, the power of prayer. That is what I am talking about. God answers prayers, but we would receive the answer according to the disposition of our hearts. So I ask you, I will not be praying for you tonight. You will pray for yourselves, and I will tell you how. 
because God loves you as much as he loves me there is no question about that God loves you with an everlasting love and God will answer your prayers amen you only need to open your heart to him you only need to ask the Spirit of God to set your heart and your mind tell them to bring my thoughts in quickly now I would explain to you tonight we would have a very special prayer the children of Israel when they prayed they prayed with incense and as you see in the psalm like 141 they said their prayers rose up like sweet smelling incense to the altar of God and you see that in Revelations 2 chapter 8 how the angels carried the golden censer which was full of the prayers of God's people and as he used the censer with the incense rising from the bowl they went right up to the altar of God so the incense it's a powerful way of praying it's a it's an old way it's a traditional way we still use it in the church the priest incenses the gifts on the altar and as that 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 smoke the sweet smelling offering rises up to the altar of God on high we see it as the sweet smelling perfume of our prayers rising up to God so we will do that sort of prayer tonight that's why I said I will not be praying for you you will pray for yourselves we are going to have here two pots it is just clay pots so that you don't think father is doing this uh, juju let me explain that what you are going to see bring it here bring it here what you will see bring the stand here my brother these are just stands and on these stands put it here on these stands we'll put two clay pots okay maybe one here for the short ones and another one here and we'll have a different one here and all that is there will be simply clay pots with charcoal charcoal burning inside and on the side box there will be a bowl or two of incense a bowl or two of incense so it is not juju it is the prayer of faith each of you whatever intentions you have in this retreat that you have been asking God for say it in your heart intone it in your heart so as we come forward in tools from the middle aisle you take a little bit of incense okay thank you you are seeing that please do the same here okay this is easier we'll put one in the lower level for the children and another one here so you take a bit of incense please don't pack it too much because we are very many in church we want to make sure it goes around take a little bit of incense and as you drop the incense into any of the clay pots and as the smoke of the incense rises up as an act of faith see it as your prayers that have been taken up to the throne of God on high this would be our prayer I would ask the lay reader who took her reading please come she would guide us through a certain psalm and we will sing in response choir you can help me I'll teach you the very simple song from Psalm 141 it simply is my prayer rises like incense my hands uplifted like an evening offering but the song version is short it's, it's this way we would sing it intermittently as she reads passages from Psalm 119 please go up my Bible is there please go up my Bible is there turn to Psalm 119 what we will do you will take two or three stanzas together and at the end of each one the people yes put yeah no no there the other one yeah. you would respond 119 listen this is the song my prayers rise like incense my hands like an evening offering put it up here put it let's try that put one here put another one here we need another box or something incense my hands like an evening offering it's okay 
Now, I know we are very many. I was hoping we could get more stands, but since we don't have them, we are going to make use of these two. In other words, there will be four points, two to my right, two to my left, as it is. As you come forward, let's move quickly, and this will be our prayers. And I ask the church wardens as well to bring out the collection baskets, put the two here. So we are going to do many things together. As you come forward, make your offering, then come take a little incense, put it in any of the pots, and proceed to your seat. So that way we can be fast. And I will stand out here. Please bring the water for me. I will stand out, put it here at the side. I will stand and as you come forward, I will sprinkle everyone with holy water. That way we can save some time so that we don't spend the whole night. Please, let me appeal. If you have a problem with smoke, because we will generate a lot of smoke from the incense, and you are sitting in front, do us a favor, find some way of relocating to the back. We don't want anybody who has asthmatic condition to get cut up here, okay? So if you have a problem with smoke, please try to find your way. At the end, at the end, this stand will be moved up to the foot of the altar so that as we offer up the bread and wine to God, it will also be a sign of our prayers rising up to God. Okay, so choir will sing, and please you read, read the stanzas, and this is what we do. Even if it is one, please, it's enough. It is symbolic. It's not how much you pack. We want it to go around. Even if it is one strand you take, just before you get here, in tune the prayers in your heart, and then drop it and move, and then leave the rest to God. So let it be an act of faith in prayers. Okay, so starting, where do we start from? From the back or the front? How do you start? From the front? Okay, fine. All right, but we also have to take care of those people from the other side. Move them all in. All right, so choir. All right, sing for, bring the holy water. Yeah. Yes, they will do off our as they come. So you take water. Yeah, bring that one close. Come, come, come. Please wait. Yeah, bring that one close. So as you come forward, we will sprinkle you with water. So let us join the choir. Please read the stanzas and then we can sing. My prayers rise like incense. My hands like a According to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their hearts. They do no wrong but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. My prayers. Are... 